Opening guest lecture, distinguished opening guest lecture of the European Peace and Security Studies program, which is co-organized by uh, Vesalius College, the Institute for European Studies, the Royal Military Academy, and the Global Governance Institute. Today is, uh, I must really say, uh, also a dream come true for me, <laughs> that I'm uh, able to stand next to Professor Johann Galtung, who, of course, you all know uh, through countless texts, articles, arguments. If you just think about, you know, you're preparing for midterms, just think about positive peace and negative peace, structural violence, all these major concepts in our discipline, here's the person responsible for it. And, uh, but I, I, I'm sure uh, any questions are allowed, but no questions on your midterm exam, that's for sure, uh, in the Q&A. Of course, Professor Galtung is not only a scholar, but he's also a very, very renowned and respected mediator. So he doesn't only write about peace and conflict situations, he really lives and breathes solutions towards major intractable conflicts. Um, I had a, the pleasure also of driving with him through Brussels traffic right now, and he mentioned that at least in 30 conflicts, he was successful also with his organization Transcend and his, his various um, activities. He's with over 15 uh, doctorate degrees, honorary doctorate degrees from a variety of universities across the world, countless publications, of course, um, and, and vast knowledge uh, on, on a variety of issues. I'm also very pleased that today he chose to focus on a topic um, that in Brussels is, um, how should I say, a, a difficult one, which is the future of the European Union foreign policy. And in fact, sometimes it's important to think outside the box. And this is uh, particularly what Professor Galton will do when he talks about the European Union foreign policy of my dreams. Um, he's meeting today and tomorrow with key leaders also of the EU. So it's very, very interesting in that sense to kind of have this view from it at this point. Without much further ado, I'd like to again introduce you with a very warm uh, welcome and over to you, Professor Johann Galt. Thank you so much. Indeed. Thank, you. Thank you, Professor Koops. It's a pleasure to be with you and I'll go straight into the business. We're talking about mediation and uh, what I've been doing since I started 55 years ago in the southern states of the US about the segregation. And I'm coming right now from Mexico, Malaysia, and Caucasus, is to try to find solutions. First, you have to know what, it's what are the solutions to. Well, there are solutions to conflict. And please don't fall into the Anglo American trap of confusing conflict with trouble and having a definition of conflict where violence is a part of it. You can say that that would have been inspired by the Brussels airport, where somebody has confused an airport with a shopping center. <laughs> and it would have been nice to have a straightforward airport, actually. It only takes half an hour to go through all the shops and finally get to the luggage. So that was the first point about EU foreign policy. Change that damn airport so that people <laughs> feel more that they have arrived in a country. It might also be a good idea to have a tourist office. To have a shop, but not a tourist office. Now, leaving that aside. My point is, of course, that in order to arrive at a solution, you have to know what a conflict is. And here's the definition of conflict. Conflict is incompatibility of goals sometimes also means. You may want two incompatible things, it's called a dilemma. You want something, somebody else also wants something, it's called a dispute. Incompatibility. Please do not confuse that with having the same goals or different goals. Surprisingly many people fall into that trap. Two men can be in love with the same woman, and I can tell you one thing, these two men want exactly the same thing. I'll not tell you what it is, I'll just tell you that's the point. It is not that they have the same goal that is the solution. It's the incompatibility. There is a famous French solution, but I'll not go into details about <laughs> such things. I'll just say that. <laughs> Wherever you have a contradiction, there is a tendency for some kind of solutions to come up. But um, uh, I'll leave that example for the time being, and it's too early in the evening anyhow to go into details. <laughs> Let me now say the following. How do you solve a conflict? You solve a conflict by respecting the goals of the parties and trying to make them compatible. How do you do that? Well, first of all, you have to know what the goals are, and secondly, you have to ask the question, 
Could it be that you could introduce something new, change reality a little bit? Because they are in a reality where there is incompatibility, maybe you could change something. So I take you a pedagogically, I give you a pedagogical example, which is very simple. The war between Ecuador and Peru, the longest lasting war in Latin American history. I was brought into that conflict when it had lasted 54 years and thousands had been killed. And it was over a zone of 500 square kilometers, incidentally about the same as the DMZ between the two Koreas, 500 square kilometers. And Ecuador said it's ours and Peru said it is ours. In other words, they had exactly the same goal, but they were somewhat incompatible. So, where is the solution? After this had been going on for 54 years, a third party, and that is usually what is bringing me into it. And the third party was the Guatemalan Foreign Ministry. And suddenly I was sitting with the ex-president of Ecuador. And he said, Mr. Galton, you know Latin America, you know our conflict, how do we draw the border? How do we draw the border? We have tried the water divide. We found a river, but it evaporated before we could mark the border. We have tried history. We have even let the boys loose and say the ceasefire line will be the border. And the Ecuadorians took all the mountain tops and the Peruvians stayed in the valleys. It would be a very strange border. Now, how do we draw the border, Professor Galton? So I said, Your Excellency, could you possibly think in terms of not drawing a border at all? but run the zone as a two-state zone with a natural park. Now, you will notice that I had a sort of convoluted sentence. Could you perhaps think in terms of, this sounds much better if you don't mediate in English, which is a horrible language for mediation. The good languages for mediation have the subjunctive mode. Como hubiera sido si ustedes en vez de esto hubieran contado en términos no? Wie wäre es, wenn Sie stattdessen das Folgende gehen? Ah, ja, also Herr Kups als die Geboren, der geborene Vermittler. So, the subjunctive is very good because you have to say something without saying it, you see. You have to indicate something. So, the ex-president said, okay, I have been in conferences about this conflict for 30 years. Nobody has ever said that. It's the first time I've heard this idea. It would take 30 years just to get used to it and then 30 more years to practice it. We don't have these 60 years. In the meantime, people are killing each other. Well, however, he said, how did you get the idea? And I said, well, one way of getting ideas when you listen to people who are parties to the conflict is not only to listen to what they say, but listen just as much to what they don't say. And for that you have to have good ears. Very good ears. Any idiot can hear what the person says. It's to hear what he doesn't say, which is important. Okay, what did I not say? The ex-president said, and I said, well, you said nothing about why drawing a border was the only solution. And I, of course, have an hypothesis why you didn't say it. And my hypothesis is that since you are a professor of law, that means Roman law, and in Roman law there is the concept of dominio, which means that everything that can be owned should be owned by only one owner. And I'm suggesting two owners, joint ownership. In other words, your professional training excludes a basic solution. So the way you think makes you think we have to divide the territory and one part to each. You are pre-programmed. And he said, but my opposite party, the president of Peru, is also a lawyer. And I said, that makes it even worse. <laughs> Not that you are a lawyer, but the point that you saying think the same way. You understand each other too well. That's the problem. So I've given you a point now. Looking into the deep culture and trying to find the parameter that you could change and bring in something new. Three years later, this became the peace treaty, 1998. 
very much happened in the meantime. And before that, I was invited to Ecuador, not to Guatemala, to talk with the bosses. And I said naively, you mean the president, the prime minister, the no, 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 I mean the bosses, the admirals and the generals. I mean the president, prime minister, they come and go. Admirals and generals stay. Okay. So suddenly I had 40 of them in front of me and I had enough gold on the shoulders to take care of the national debt, as far as I could see. Fascinating eight hours, a dream for a mediator to be pressed hard. What happens if a Peruvian kills an Ecuadorian in that zone? Will it be according to Peruvian law, Ecuadorian law, or will there be a zone law? Delicate, delicious problems. And when I thought I knew the answer, I said it, and when I thought I didn't know, I didn't say anything, but gave some advice about where to find it. So, this is a conflict unknown in Europe, very well known in Latin America. 1998, I signed a treaty. But on the way to that one, I had discovered the importance when you have a solution to something, you should be able to say it in not more than four words. Because you're dealing with journalists and they can manage a message in four words, but the moment you have eight words, they forget two of them and they substitute a not to make the sentence sound longer or something like that. So my formula was two-state solution, natural park. It became an economic, joint economic zone. So, the formula to do it has three points. And don't now think that you have learned how to do it. It's quite tricky. But the three points are roughly speaking the following. You meet with one party at a time. For heaven's sake, don't have a table with all the parties. For heaven's sake, don't do it. They're not prepared for it. One party at a time. The way you approach them is called the dialogue. In the dialogue, each sentence ends with a question mark. In the debate, it ends with an exclamation sign. How would it be? And that's where the subjunctive mode enters. Now I can tell you what my opening question is. What does that zone up in the Andes look like that you would like to see? What does Afghanistan look like that you would like to see? If you are in one of the gypsy countries, the gypsy countries, as you know, are Greece, Italy, Portugal, Spain, Ireland the periphery countries in European Union. So if you are in a gypsy country, what is the European Union you would like to see? What does it look like? What is its economic policy? In other words, you want from the parties their positive story about the situation. What is the Syria you would like to see? I mentioned Afghanistan, Somalia, I could jump from any one to the other. And the second question is, Tell me what do you think is happening now? And the third question is, was there a good period in the past? I have asked you what is the marriage you would like to live in. Yes, there was some nice period, but he was only a hypocrite, he didn't really mean it. Please tell me about the hypocrisy, what kind of hypocrisy was it? And so on, and the fourth thing is of course, what are you most afraid of? Will happen? If you go through this, you get an enormous amount of information, an enormous amount of information about the parties. You will get their dreams and their nightmares, their nostalgia and their so-called realism. And their so-called realism is that everything would be better if it hadn't been for that one. Now, women are less into that. That's mainly men and mainly in the hormonal age. So as a Swedish friend of mine, she is a biologist, says, by the age of 65, men become almost human. <laughs> it's the period between 14 and 65, which is the difficult one. And below 14, you can see human characteristics in males. Now, this is getting a little bit far, but um, something to it. Now, 
I think there is a way of overcoming it, and that is solution orientation instead of punishment orientation. If you use the word justice, peace with justice, be careful. Because the word justice may open for punishment, but if you use it in the sense of social justice, redistribution and equity, you are on a good road. So having said that, the third part after the dialogue is the jump to a solution. For that jump you need creativity. Diplomats get creativity after retirement. Why is that? Well, diplomats are not there to solve conflicts. They are to promote the interests of the leading nation in their state, which is something quite different. They can be trained, but the fact that they are dressed, are polyglot, behave in a nice way, sometimes charming, is not enough to be creative. So when I put together a team, I prefer artists, engineers and architects. For heaven's sake, keep social scientists out of it. They are too empirical, too positivistic. We need people with imagination. Women are usually better than men. And if you have a, but the exception would be a woman with a law degree, a doctorate in law, or a PhD in political science. Am I against it? No. I only would like to emphasize that she has gotten her doctorate in a science constructed by men. Very many women are very aware of it, and out of that will come good things. Let me now mention concrete things. The European Union is a glittering success in having been able to create peace among countries that were at each other's throat for 800 to 1,000 years. A glittering success. That success is exportable. It is a very, very important thing for the European Union to have an active diplomacy for a Middle East community, a Central Asian community, and a Northeast Asian community. They need your help. They need to open the archives, tell what the problems were, what were the counter-arguments, how did you get started, how did you get going. Open the box. It's a beautiful box, and it ended well. The European Union is practicing among its members, 28, what it fails to practice abroad. If the European Union had followed what they practice inside abroad, it would have been a considerably better, better policy. Next point. There are regions coming in the world now. The European Union, African Union, SARC, ASEAN exist, and there are four more unions coming. And they're all important. The Union of Latin America and the Caribbean, the Organization of Islamic, not only cooperation, but a community. It's 57 countries with 1,650 million members. There are more Muslims than Chinese. And to be Chinese in numbers is already quite something. Now, if you look at that, there is an East Asian community or Northeast Asian community coming. And the net result of all of this is inevitable a world of regions. Those regions could have a united regions. I apologize for this, but sometimes happens. And that united regions would have the European Union as a model. It should not compete with the United Nations, but it could have one extremely important asset no veto power. No member of the European Union has veto, and the veto power is killing the United Nations. The United Regions would be a very good idea. For this to happen, the European Union should improve its relations to others. And what I am going to say is negative when it comes to the relation to USA. If you want the European Union economy to go further down, go in for transatlantic partnership. With a bankrupt country, the most indebted country in world history, with a Congress unable to solve the simplest problems, don't think they will find a way out of it. They are probably 
by and large for the time being lost and will have to reconsider their economy considerably. But we're not talking only about economic relations, we're also talking about spying relations. If you can tolerate being spied upon that way, at all kind of essential points, you deserve to go down. If you can tolerate that and don't issue a warning to that country, a very clear warning, it's your fault, and you'll go down with them. Be aware of the fact that the BRICS countries are now, by 2015, they will launch alternative internet organizations. So you can forget about all those internet organizations that cooperate with CIA and NSA. It would be in the European interest to join the BRICS line where that's concerned. But more positively, the relation to the Islamic world. I would be gambling on three points would be extremely important to get Turkey inside. And the French and the German opposition is essentially racist and should be neglected. To get Turkey inside would make Istanbul a key cornerstone in the world. And it would bring together 500 million Europeans with 1,650 million Muslims. It would be a fantastic thing. And as a little adjunct to this, it would give the European Union a chance to remedy a major mistake it made with Cyprus. Recognize the Turkish northern part. You know perfectly well that the difficulty in 74 was not initiated by Turkey but by Greece. You know it perfectly well. To reward them the way that the European Union did doesn't belong anywhere. As a matter of fact, if I were a European Union politician, knowing what Greece has done, I would expel Greece and have a good time with your drachma, enjoy yourself. What they have done to the European Union on nasty things, including the fake budget that they presented to get the membership, is not nice. But leaving that aside, Cyprus would then decide whether it is a unitary state, a federation or a confederation, and the whole package will be a member. This is a small side issue, but it is a little bit important in the Middle East and would mean quite a lot. It would also put a limitation on the influence of Russian monetary oligarchs. The next point will be dialogue of civilizations. I have myself neither a Christian nor a Muslim, but more a kind of Buddhist pagan. I myself have been moderating quite a lot of dialogues of that type, at least 20. And the experience is the following. The way I do it is to ask both parties what are you most afraid of, and to ask both parties what you like most in the other side. <laughs> when being most afraid of, they are both most afraid of holy war. And the Westerners confuse that with jihad, which doesn't mean that at all, but has as a fourth stage defensive holy war. And on the Muslim side, Aquinas, Augustine, and their doctrines. And then I ask them, what do you like most? The Muslim answer is, what we like about the West is its diversity that there is Christianity and Christianity and Christianity. At home where we are, there is one Islam. That of course is not quite true. There are several Islams, but they are far apart and geographically divided. We would like to have more diversity, and that diversity legitimized. Then I ask the Christians, what is it you like particularly about Islam? No answer. So I ask again, no answer. Comes out very quickly, it is not because they dislike the whole thing, but because they know absolutely nothing. The only thing they know and associate with the word Islam is terrorism. Now, this is not good enough. And it brings us to the crucial point that 11 of the European 28 members of the Union are old colonial powers who all did the same thing they try to mold other countries in their image, like God is reputed to have been doing when he created man. They were imitating the Bible. 
and they didn't learn one single thing except picking up some spices. It doesn't mean that you don't have a couple of professors and some institutes that didn't learn anything. If I now should point to two basic points about this learning, just two basic points, closeness and sharing. You can watch the closeness when they are praying and the sharing of the zakat. And the Ramadan as a memory, being aware of what it means not to have anything to eat and drink. You can say they compensate in the evenings. Yes, they do. But try to get all of the European Union membership to fast every day from sunrise to sunset in Mecca. Yeah? It's in Mecca. Every day for one month. Try that one. And you can see how much spiritual strength there is in an average European. They manage that. It impresses many. Now, if you then look at Europe, you will find individualism instead of togetherness. And you will find non-sharing, but bureaucratic distribution. But not from person to person. What conclusion can you draw? Massive conversion to Islam in Europe, particularly in France, which probably has the most egocentric culture in Europe. I think it's hard to beat them. It doesn't mean they don't have institutions. But you will get a conversion to Islam, which is not only due to the strength of Islam, but to our weakness. 40% of households in Sweden consist of one person. Loneliness. Loneliness. If you think that development is compatible with 40% lonely, I think you are wrong. So how do you overcome that? Well, one way of overcoming it would be to invite Africans to study European countries as technical assistants about how to overcome loneliness. <laughs> Africans have an enormous amount of ideas about it. In 1973, the head of the Institute for Development in Studies at the University of Sussex invited an African delegation of 25 uh, politicians and social scientists to study the United Kingdom to find out what was aching and come up with some solutions. They found two problems, one was racism and the other one was loneliness. An enormous loneliness. So they published a report and the report had an immediate impact at the government level. The government reacted immediately. The government was Margaret Thatcher. She cancelled the money to that institute. <laughs> Now, this doesn't work. You cannot combine ignorance about the countries you dominated with the arrogance of thinking you have nothing to learn. Sit down. You give technical assistance, make it symmetric. Development assistance one way is an insult. Doesn't work. You all know the African study about it. It doesn't work. Make it symmetric. It could work. At the same time, be strong enough to admit the major problem of the European countries. Not only loneliness, but increasing loneliness. You put in a card in a hole in the wall and you get your retirement <coughs> money. You go to a supermarket where there is an assembly line with goods in one direction and money across the board. And that's about the human contact you have. Doesn't work. That brings up the third world. How do you relate to that? You relate to it, I think, by admitting the wrongs you have done. In very few cases, genocide, not sociocide. Killing the societies. Genocide in Congo. We are still missing the monument in honor of the 10 million killed under King Leopold in this city. We are still missing that one. Sociocide all over destroying the structure, destroying the culture, sitting in Berlin, drawing lines, lines that are crazy, that cut nations into two or three or four, 
and assemble into a package called a country or a colony to start with things that don't belong together at all. And all this monstrosity is this handed over to posterity under the name of decolonization. Well, how does one apologize for that? Europeans are rent of having to pay compensation money. I think a much better approach would be to do it the way it was done by the masters of reconciliation. Some of them live in South Africa, but others live in Germany, and the Germans are not themselves aware of how damn good they are. I'm thinking of Gustav Heidemann, and I'm thinking of changing the textbooks, rewriting the textbooks. It was inspired by a UNESCO project between Poland and Germany, trying to come up with a joint text that both parties could accept. Some points they didn't accept. Now, there's a very simple method. You print the Polish version on the left page and the German version on the right page. I trust that your readers are bright enough to make up their mind and maybe learn from both. Now, a book about that, about colonialism, would be fantastic. It would be a major contribution to foreign policy and foreign relations. Don't be afraid. You can enter into it. But you will have to mobilize the best historians you can find from all parties. To try to just simply say what happened, be honest about it, be frank about it. And the Germans are so frank about it that when I give lectures in Germany today, <coughs> I sometimes find students who say, we have read in our history books about the Second World War. Professor Galter, was there something else happening than Auschwitz? Yeah, that is, the Germans sometimes exaggerate a little bit, to put it that way. There were a couple of other things that happened. You might call them Dresden and Hamburg. They have names, some of these things, for instance. Now, to have a look at that is extremely important, and I will try to get a bit reciprocal technical assistance. How do you approach Russia? Have a look at the history of European and Russian, or Western European and Russian relations, since about year 1200. You will find with two exceptions, it was West invading East. Starting with the Temple Ritter, the Johanniten, starting with them. And then you have names like Napoleon and Hitler coming. The reason why Hitler did it was to humiliate France. Since France has Napoleon as the local saint, uh, calling him a genius and things like that. The guy who won all the battles and lost all the wars is called a genius, which is a rather strange concept of genius. But my point is not this. My point is, both those occasions, the Russians sit back. The Russians occupied Paris after 1812 for a short period, and the Russians came back and tried to convert Eastern Europe into a bulwark against further invasions. It is terribly asymmetric, and there are things here in need of a good history book. One very one-sided history book is written by one of the greatest authors the world has ever seen, Leo Tolstoy. And the book is Why I Mir, War and Peace. If you haven't read it, I can only assure you, you have a great thing waiting for you. The book is waiting for your eyes and your soul, and you'll grow by reading it. Now, having said that, how do you relate to China? I think it is important to know that the so-called Silk Road was not a road, it was a sea lane. It lasted 1,000 years from 500 to 1,500. It was a Buddhist Eastern China cooperation with Muslim East Africa. A head bridge head in Africa was Somalia, which was by far the richest country in Africa. So it was between Somalia and other parts of East Africa and East China. They didn't even touch Europe. Europe the word is Assyrian and means darkness. 
Now that doesn't sound very complimentary, but the point about it was there were so many forests, so it looked rather dark. On the way, they of course passed Southeast Asia, East Asia, and the other peninsula. And who killed it in 1500? The Portuguese and the English. They're both members of the European Union. China is waiting for a reassessment of what happened. China is waiting. The Portuguese landed in Macau and the English in Hong Kong. It is a rather a testimony to Chinese greatness that they haven't erased those two places. When you think of the opium, the gunboat diplomacy, all the viciousness that came with it. Hong Kong reverted to China under the formula, one country, two systems. And I am very often in China and I've launched the slogan, one country, six systems. That makes them a little bit nervous and a little bit in doubt about my ability to count. So I claim and show them my PhD in mathematics so I can count to six. <laughs> and I'll tell you which the six are. Point one. Mainland China, Han China, obvious. Taiwan, Hong Kong, Macau, we're up to three. Tibet, Inner Mongolia, and Sichuan. Not Sichuan, I mean the Xinjiang, the Uyghur territory. Tibet is Buddhist. The Uyghurs are Muslims, the Mongolians are essentially Buddhist, the Hong Kong Macau people are Christian, the Taiwan people are very interesting. They are Chinese. They walk like Chinese, talk like Chinese and eat like Chinese. So you may draw the conclusion they are Chinese. But they have a very special history. So. The best solution to all of that is the solution they found with Hong Kong Macau. And you may know the name for Hong Kong after that. It's called Hong Kong, China. From the Chinese point of view, this means Hong Kong is a part of China. And from the Hong Kong point of view, it means a mailing address. If you want to know where we are, look at the map of China. It's called ambiguity. And for once I have to give a compliment to diplomats. Ambiguity can be very useful. So I'm arguing in China, I'm arguing Taiwan, comma China, Tibet, comma China, Xinjiang, comma China, in the Mongolia, comma China. Where am I arguing that? Not in the foreign ministry. Those are bureaucrats. And I'm invited to the party school for the um, Superior Council of the Communist Party of the People's Republic of China. That's where the things happen. And I've been talking there about this once. And the other time I was invited to talk about the possible decline and fall of the Communist dynasty in China. I haven't gotten that invitation from Washington, but I got it from China. I'm not say what I said, I'll just say there is an enormous amount of dialogue going on in China. If you think this is a country devoid of dialogue, it's only because you don't know it. But on one point they affirm, we don't accept multi-party national elections. China is an organic whole with its own dialectic. But dialectic is something you listen to and that requires education. For which reason 80% of the 80 million members of the Communist Party have a university degree. China is today an academic's paradise. You can even be a woman, 30% are women, but some time ago it was nothing. And it's increasing. Now I say that because this is a China European Union doesn't know. Like it doesn't know Islam. Like it doesn't know Russia. And that arrogance doesn't bring us anywhere. Yesterday was my last day at the Dialogue of Civilizations organized by the Russians, and they do it in Rodos. 
swarms of Chinese. It is very much, if you will, the SEO spirit, Shanghai Cooperation Organization. An extreme optimism. They claim spirituality and they're blaming European Union for excessive materialism, for only being interested in economic growth. They talk a lot about loneliness and its opposite. They talk a lot about how they want to relate to the European Union through infrastructure. And you will have Chinese trains creeping into you to a very large extent very soon. You will find them any bit as efficient as those that are made by Siemens. Now, having said that, China and Russia want a relation. But they want a relation to a European Union that is knowledgeable about them. So I mentioned these points, and I'm coming now towards the end, but I will say some words about Syria. It is the major topic for tomorrow, and um, it is a very important topic. Syria is part of a French crime. It's impossible to talk about Syria without talking about Sykes-Picot. If you don't know what is Sykes-Picot, you should be ashamed of yourselves. Sykes-Picot, any Arab school child know the names of the English and the French foreign minister in 1915. You say that if you Arabs raise up against the Turks, the Ottomans, you will be amply rewarded with freedom. The reward was four colonies, two of them French, Syrie, Lebanon, two of them English, Palestine, Iraq, all four of them catastrophes. Why catastrophes? because they just drew lines around something non-organic that had all kinds of contradictions inside and the Ottoman Empire ruled Syria for four centuries from 1516 to 1916 Ottoman Empire and one method that I have as I have told you is to say was there a period when it was better Okay, the French colonized it, and it was not run by this clan or that clan. It was not run by Shia or Sunni. It was not run by Christians or Jews or Armenians or Assyrians or Maronites or Druze, or whatever you can find in Syria. It was not run by that, it was run by Paris. And that is called uh, bringing Western civilization or something of the type. Well, they have some highfalutin names for it. The Syrians call it a crime. Now, out of this then, if you go back in the past, you find something interesting that the Ottomans did, called the millet. And it was the autonomy for the non-Muslim nations. They were Christians and Jews, Armenians, and as you know, Armenians have their own Christianity before the Orthodox Church in Russia. Georgians, they have their own Christianity, and the Azeris, Azerbaijan, of course, is Muslim. All of this were in Syria, and they had a considerable amount of autonomy. So I'm mediating a talk, which I try to do, I talk with everybody one-on-one, -on -one, never more than one. The table is very small, I don't offer Muslim drinks, I offer them water, and they offer me water. And the agenda I have told you something about. What then transpires, you see, is a struggle between a minority dictatorship and a coming majority dictatorship, which will be Sunni Islamist, very much linked to Al-Qaeda, and supported by CIA. Now, one reason why it is supported by CIA, it's the ignorance of that organization. Central, yes. Agency, yes. Intelligence. <clears throat> so if you look at that, what was it the Turks did? They respected diversity. Why did they do that? Because as Muslims they have no difficulties with Christians and Jews. They are part of the Kitab, the book, the Torah for the Jews, the Quran for the Muslims, the Old Testament for the Christians. They meet in that one. 
but they can expand it to others. So a possible solution for Celia is a parliament with two chambers. One chamber is provincial, and the provinces are still from the Ottoman Empire. And the other is the nations, the millet, all of them. When I count, they usually end at eight, without people saying there is much more. What are they concerned with? Their concerns is respect for their identity, their language, their worldview, their religion, their history, their myths, their role. So that points to education, points to autonomy for them, to the right not only be taught their own language and religion, but to teach in their own language. Teach, for instance, mathematics. To go for a very pluralistic education system, and the nations would have, let us say, veto. The point about Assad is that he is good with all the non-Muslim nations. The point about the Sunnis from Qatar and Saudi Arabia, and logistically, militarily helped by CIA and NSA, and with the NSA spying machinery at their disposal. The point about them is they're very bad at it. It will be a disaster for them. Now, if the European Union wants to take a stand in favor of one or the other, I would say you don't have to. In the choice between pest and cholera, you might be against both of them. And this is where Putin's genius comes in. And Putin did what the European Union should have had the intellectual capacity to do. Namely saying, let us talk a little bit less about who did it and more about the arms. Let's get rid of the arms. And using chemical arms as a beginning for weapons of mass destruction. When in that, of course, comes sooner or later a Middle East nuclear free zone, and that the Americans might be able to confess that, yes, the Israelis have nuclear bombs. There's a lot of that in the future. But to me, much more essential than arms control is a solution to the political problem. So I just indicate something. Now, I have to say it in four words, and that is two-chamber parliament, that's two words, nations with nation, national veto. Now, obviously, only in matters of their own concern. You see, the point about those nations in Syria, they don't have the decency of the Swiss, who are orderly people. With the Germans speaking in the east, the French speaking in the west, the Italians speaking in the south, and the Ladino, that the Romani speaking in the middle. They live around each other. With one exception, the Kurds, who live along the Turkish border. And want association with other Kurds, which is another issue. For that reason, you have to have a non-territorial federation. With a territorial aspect based on the provinces, and non-territorial with the non-provinces. Needless to say, this is too complicated for an average politician. So I'll end with my experience. My experience is, I say, NGO mediated. That I have an enormous advantage. I don't have bombs and money. I cannot threaten people. And I cannot corrupt them. By separate trade deals, by money for technical assistance and things of that kind. I cannot do anything about it. The only type of power a guy like I have is idea power. So that means the ideas have to be good. If you have a country that has lots of bombs and lots of bribing money, some of it recently printed, they think they can do without ideas. It is on the other side of the Atlantic, and the European Union is too inspired by that country. And it's non-diplomacy in the non-visibility of the European Union. So, I opt for idea power. And my experience is, to quote Arthur Schopenhauer, that if you have an idea, the first reaction would be laughter. It's the most ridiculous we ever heard. And the second reaction would be suspicion. Whom is he favoring? What is this in favor of? 
And the third reaction is a politician who stands up and says, it's always been my idea. I have heard that a couple of times. I invite you to try to do the same. Good luck.